Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Frank. I, I thought, well, how do I really fit in um, uh, amongst this uh, group this morning to talk about public reporting? No one kind of really wants to talk too much about public reporting. So what I chose to do, first I have no disclosures, what, what I chose to do was to hit four, four topics. Because I think this is kind of why it's important. Healthcare is changing. Public reporting is a fact of life. So really what's happening on the transparency front? Where does it fit into how we make decisions as patients and as providers? And what does it really do to help us drive improvement and clearly to become part of the basis for, for payment as we move forward? So I'll briefly touch on these topics. First around transparency. Uh, definition of transparency, it is how we operate in ways that it makes it easy for others to see what actions are performed. But really, this is what it's about. It's about openness, communication, and accountability. We've heard about that for, for three days now. But I think we have to keep this uh, right at the forefront because transparency is kind of what it's all about at the moment. We really are into that era. We're all consumers. Uh, we're all consumers of healthcare. We're consumers of everything. And for every other product out there, uh, you can look at the quality and the price of the products. Uh, we can't do that very well in healthcare, but we're getting better at that, and clearly that is important. And as former uh, Health and Human Services Secretary Mike Levitt said, you know, every American should have access to a full range of information about the quality and cost of their healthcare options. Uh, we are on that path and need to uh, continue to help support it, and you've heard Frank say that already around this equation. So transparency is about the creating value. It's about the quality and the cost side of it. And the way I view that is the quality part of it are the things we've been talking about. It's the safety, it's the outcomes, it's the experience. Uh, and I think we've, you in the room, believe that. We have to help everyone else believe that and work towards creating this part of the value equation. This is something we can do. The cost side of it is the change. The change from going, going from fee for service to bundle payments, capitation, some of the things Frank touched on. But it's getting this balance right. The, the country cannot afford to continue to provide healthcare at the cost uh, that we currently do. Marty, I hope you're still in the room. I always give a plug for Marty because I think his book, Unaccountable, really is uh, an important bit about transparency. It's, it's helped open the dialogue. And there are multiple bits like this out there about creating accountability. And it is about uh, the transparency that can, and I believe will, revolutionize healthcare. So that open dialogue, I think, really is important. Those of you who haven't read it, it's well worth the read. Equally, I was back home in Scotland last couple of weeks ago, uh, and this is not a problem that's unique to us. This is one of the big national newspapers in the UK, uh, where I really thought they were well ahead of us, and in many ways the UK has been ahead in terms of safety and some of the transparency. But uh, it's one of the things we as a group have talked a bit about over the last few days. How do you sustain those gains? And... Uh, I have some good friends in the UK who have worked in this field, and they're saying, you know, things have been slipping a bit, and right back on the radar screen at the moment is uh, public reporting at an individual certain level about outcomes, and there's a lot of pushback. So this isn't just a US problem issue, this is where the world is in terms of thinking about transparency in healthcare. We are in that era of transparency. Uh, and we need to support it. What about the decision-making side of public reporting? I see this in two ways. Decision-making for patients. Patients are more informed. Where should I go? Who should I see? And I think it is what public reporting information is that are out there to help them make the decision. But it's also for the uh, providers in terms of who is going to get the patients? It's the insurance companies, it's the, uh, it's, uh, the businesses, a lot of uh, the major companies are looking for outlets for their employees, 
and referrals on that basis. So who's providing the best outcomes and who's providing value? So the decision making on these two fronts I think are important. The data for decision making uh, is evolving. I think it has come a long way in the last decade, but there's still a long way to go. And really, you come back to this as being your main source of data still, what comes out on the scorecard that every hospital is uh, judged by, uh, hospital compare, and physician compare that is up now, but it's not putting out the quality metrics yet, but over the next two or three years, metrics are going to be out there by groups and then by individuals looking at performance. And the data that are out there, I'm not going to go into in detail, but it's clinical data, some administrative data, survey data, the experience surveys, and cost data, the Medicare spend beneficiary, and other cost data coming up on these public sites. These are validated, risk-adjusted, and by and large are the source for most of the other scorecards that are out there come back to using data that is available for every hospital on hospital compare. And the same is happening. The last decade has been the hospital decade. The next decade is the provider decade in terms of public reporting of metrics. At a very high level, this is what is out there in hospital compare. The menu down the uh, left side here is uh, the component bits of it, patient surveys, core measures, timely effective care, the readmissions, complications, the hacks, the PSIs, etc. All things we love and work to. Uh, there is a lot out there. It has grown a lot. It is stabilizing. It is changing. So I think we all look at this. We all work to this. But these are the sources for most of the other scorecards that exist out there. Uh, Frank alluded to the fact that uh, NISQIP has been reporting for over a year now. And I do applaud the 102 centers that are up. And there should be a refresh this month. And I'm not sure how many more have added into that. It was 80 the first cycle, it was 102 the second. Hopefully there are more coming up this cycle. Because I do believe that registry data, and I applaud the college and I applaud you who have done it, in leading the charge on registry data coming up for public reporting. I do believe that this needs to grow and expand. We believe this is better data. We need to be willing to be out there showing that data and helping expand it. Uh, you know, we're average, and I know that. I've got work to do. Other scorecards that are out there, there's a zillion of them. These are just some of them uh, that are sitting out there. You know, the US News uh, updated their uh, list yesterday. LeapFrog we've talked about. Cost, I think, is a very interesting group where you can really dial in to look at cost and outcomes. For a lot of centers, they're getting increased penetration. Consumer report are clearly out there. Remember, most of these use data from hospital compare as part of how they rank and grade performance, all, almost all at a hospital level at the present time, but increasingly we're going to see provider-based reporting as well. When we think about public reporting as a driver of improvement, we're back to what we again have heard many times over the last few days. If you don't measure it, you don't improve it. But what are we all working on? I would submit that most of us are working on mortality, readmissions, patient experience, hospital fire conditions, etc. Why? Because these are the public reported things out there. Put, it's put it on the radar screen. And I think the mere fact that these have been publicly reported increasingly over the last decade have helped drive the menu. Uh, of what we have worked towards. I think we can do better in terms of performance improvement as we move to more of a clinical outcomes metrics. And this is where the uh, NISPIP work and some of the other registries. Uh, we're not alone. I think STS and the critical outcomes for the ICUs and some of the other clinical registries that in a similar way will help drive per performance even faster as we look at uh, what are our drivers of performance improvement. I'd highlight a couple of the national programs sitting out there. On the left is the Partnership for Patients, and I would guess that many of you in the room, if not most of you, work within that program. The value of this that I saw was it was a national agenda. 
a national agenda that we will get a 40% reduction in harm, 20% reduction in readmissions over three years. It was the first time the country had put out some very specific goals and targets to drive performance improvement. And they're making progress, but it galvanized through the hospital engagement networks people to really focus on the things by and large hospitals were working on anyway. And I think it has been an opportunity for learning networks to develop. A lot of the things that uh, you, the college, NSQIP have done over the last decade kind of came onto a national scene. <clears throat> Equally, you have heard some, some of you over the last two or three days about the Centre for Transforming Healthcare, the Joint Commission, and the reducing SSI. We've heard too much about colon surgery and infection in the last couple of days. We're reducing them. And I think you've seen these numbers that, in fact, in that, the pilot, the leading part of that project, there was significant reduction in all the initial pilot centers in surgical site infections. It's how we disseminate that. It's how you take those lessons learned. But I think these are two good examples of national uh, performance improvement. So what are you doing? I suspect you're all working on similar things as we look at the expanding number of NISCOP centers. I think that is important. And I, the way I really view it is that uh, NISQIP, some of the clinical registries, really enhance your ability to do performance improvement on the national metrics that are out there. They're using better data to drive that improvement. And I suspect you're all working on very similar things. I don't think I need to challenge you to come up with goals and specific targets. Finally, I think as you look at the value of public reporting, and I'm standing up here defending public reporting because I think it does bring value, is it has become the basis for payment. Uh, pay for performance started in, uh, this, in last year with the value-based purchasing program, the readmission reduction program. That's the tip of the iceberg. Coming uh, the uh, hospital acquired condition penalty program, it's in proposed rules at the moment. It's probably getting a lot of flack. Frank can probably tell me more about that than I know. Uh, but, and also on the provider front, the physician value modifier, the things have been reported around PQRS, but also the data are coming out, particularly in some of the chronic disease management spaces, around unnecessary admissions, readmission rates, cost per uh, covered life. The data that are coming out at the provider level is significant that are coming into the physician value modifier that is going to adjust base physician payment 2015. So there's a lot happening in the pay for performance uh, front, and this all comes off the uh, public reported data. Uh, very briefly, uh, you know, value based purchasing, of course, started just with uh, patient experience and core measures. Uh, the current uh, adjustments that are being made on that are very rapidly evolving into uh, some of the other outcomes with mortality and hospital acquired infections and PSIs and with the Medicare spend for beneficiaries. So very rapidly over the first couple of years you've got a lot more metrics coming in there and you're seeing a rapid diminution of process measures towards more of the outcomes and the cost side of the equation that will adjust base payment for every hospital. On the penalty programs, I think these are uh, really where they make money. The value-based pension program, of course, is budget neutral. CMS is not making money in that. Penalty programs are making money. If you're worse than the national median, you're going to be penalized. And I think you're aware of that. And our next week, we'll probably touch on these a bit further. Uh, and again, hospital-acquired condition penalty program is really targeting that lowest quartile in the country. Uh, where significant penalties can creep in. This year we're at 1%, next year it's 2%, next year it's 3% potential penalties <coughs> for the readmission reduction program. Big money starts to move on, on the penalty programs. And these come off, again, public reported metrics. So where does NISCOP really fit into this? I think it is how we collect and use the data to drive improvement. I would submit that um, many of those public metrics that are out there programs that you all have out there to drive improvement are largely driven off your clinical uh, data out of NISQIP. Uh, it does improve outcomes. You've seen some of the mortality data, you know the morbidity data. Uh, it really does work. Uh, and in doing that, you're reducing cost. Again, the cost has always been a bit 
problematic because so much of the cost savings and being cost avoidance, if we don't have this event, the costs are down, but uh, you don't show the green dollars to your CFO. But believe me, over the next five years, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to be real money as we move to some of your payment models. And this really is the core program to help your hospital. And I would submit over this next four or five years, your surgeons, who are going to require much more specific data on their outcomes uh, as we move to the provide a bit of uh, public reporting of data. We've seen several pyramids over the last few days. I'll give you my pyramid of how I really see much of this coming together at the present time, how I want to really achieve the high reliability through the building blocks of setting goals and standards uh, and accountability to that performance. That's what I think most of you do in your hospitals, but get it specific. It's about leadership commitment. It's about the culture. Culture of safety, but I would submit culture overall in your hospitals and in institutes. It's about the employee engagement. It's about uh, the accountability components of culture. It's about performance improvement leading to high reliability. And again, if you're structuring your programs with these progressive elements, you're, I am sure, making significant progress in moving to uh, improving outcomes. It is all about the patient, and let's not forget that. Uh, we talk a lot about driving to do this for all these other reasons, but step back, we're driving to do this because it's improving the outcomes for our patients, and oh by the way, it's making our public metrics and things look better, and it's becoming financially important. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present this to you.